Amen, amen. Thank you, sir. Yeah, we should have done a little chain, 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 shall we? But then we'd have to change the words. Chain of fools won't work. Well, I guess we could go with 1 Corinthians. Not many wives among you. Amen. Well, glory. Well, we're going to do an experiment tonight. Find out if I can stand up for an hour. My doctor said I need to walk, so I said, well, I might as well just preach then. Huh? Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, join with me as we start a new adventure. And go with me. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 2. I'm going to fool you. You thought I was going to say Hebrews 1, didn't you? But our, uh, our quest tonight is to A, kind of lay out a plan for what we're going to do here. And then B, to find a good thematic text for our study that we're beginning on the book of Hebrews. When you think about Hebrews, I don't know what you think about, if you think about anything. Uh, I have several favorite texts, you know, out of Hebrews, like any good preacher. Hebrews chapter 4, it's hard not to remember about coming boldly to the throne of grace and finding mercy and grace to help in the time of need because we have a great high priest who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities was all points tempted like as we are. It's the 15th and the 16th verse. And then uh, in uh, chapter 12, you know, we want to run with patience the race that is set before us with our great cloud of witnesses uh, cheering us on. Amen. And then any good faith preacher has, uh, knows that in the 11th chapter you can preach almost everything you need to know about faith because by faith everybody in that list of Old Testament uh, patriarchs and saints uh, that did stuff by faith gives you a premise to preach just about anything you want to preach. But uh, certainly every, every good faith preacher has used verse 6. Without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. Uh, who was he talking about when he said that, you know? Which one of the pantheon of, of faith greats? Anybody know? Uh-uh. Moses was the last one of the attributed list. This was in the sixth verse. Who? Thank you. Enoch. Uh, how did Enoch demonstrate great faith? Anybody remember? He walked with God and he was not. Amen. Enoch is our, our prototype of the rapture of the church. Amen. We're going to walk with God and then one day we'll just be not. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> all the good Pentecostals from especially the, the healing meetings of the 1940s and the tent meetings, Everybody knew verse 8 of chapter 13. See, you didn't go to any tent meetings in the 40s, I can tell. <laughs> Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Amen. So uh, there's all kinds of, of uh, uh, texts that we can pull out of Hebrews that, uh, are, that make good preaching. Uh, Damon pulled one out of chapter 9 on Sunday to talk about communion because he went into the holiest of all with his own precious blood. Amen. Having obtained redemption once for all. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That's in the ninth chapter, so it'll be a while before we get there. But the book of Hebrews is uh, all one book. Some people refer to it as the in many older Bibles, it says that it's the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews. But there's some debate about, A, whether it's an epistle, and B, whether the Apostle wrote it or not. But for the purposes of our study, 
and uh, hopefully by the time we get through tonight, uh, you'll at least begin to get a glimmer. I'm going to pull uh, Hebrews chapter 2, the first four verses, as our text for the theme of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we've heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. I love that phrase, so great a salvation. As a matter of fact, I think that's what I'm going to entitle these next 572 messages. <laughs> Frankly, I have no idea how long we'll be here. But the last book only took us three and a half years, so this one is shorter, actually. <laughs> Amen. Uh, in reading the book of Hebrews, there are several questions that everybody asks who is around it for any length of time. And the first one is, who wrote it? Uh, I want to discuss that very briefly, not very at any great length, because at this point in time, it is so deeply embedded in the canon of Scripture and that the authorship is really sort of a moot point. <clears throat> but uh, uh, the question I think is, is more, that's more interesting is, was it an epistle or not? Was it intended to be a letter to the church somewhere? Because if you go back and read the, the letters uh, of Paul and, and uh, John and Peter to, to the churches, you know, they had a very consistent sort of a form. Uh, there was always a little greeting at the beginning. And then usually they were addressing some problem or issue that was going on in that church at that time. And sometimes you have to kind of discern what that was by reading the the text, because sometimes they don't even come out and tell you what it is. They just start answering questions, and you have to figure out what the question was. And with Hebrews, we're going to go through some of that. We're going to, we're going to uh, look at what the text says, assuming that God inspired it to be written, and uh, try to. we're going to have to discern from the text, because history doesn't tell us uh, who was being written to and what the purpose of the writing was. Because that makes a difference in how you read the book. And then secondly, we'll look for some of the subtext that we can get from the context and we can learn some things that were not the intent of the writer to teach, but that we can uh, derive by inference from what he taught. Does that, does that make any sense? For instance, when we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, we always uh, go there for our great text on the gifts of the Spirit. But Paul wasn't teaching on the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12. He mentioned the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12 as a part of his teaching on the unity of the body of Christ. Amen. So uh, I've, I've uh, followed some scholars, you know, who said that when you interpret a text, you can only interpret it in the light of what it was intended to teach to the people that originally received the letter. I said, well, if you do that, that cuts down our sermon significantly. <laughs> because a lot of things that we, uh, we discern from those texts are things that are not clearly taught, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in the New Testament, because they were so much a part of the warp and woof of daily life of those people, they didn't need explanation to those people. When the Corinthians got the letter to the Corinthians and they read, uh, to some he gave a word of wisdom, to some a word of knowledge, to some discerning of spirit, they knew exactly what he was talking about. We don't know. But it was part of their day. Every time they got together, apparently this thing was just blowing up. Amen. 2,000 years later, we're kind of going, I wonder what that is. You know, we're trying to figure out what he was talking about. Amen. So with the book of Hebrews, we're going to find some of those things. Some of the things we'll find, uh, hopefully you'll find interesting. And then uh, beyond just trying to dig into some, some uh, uh, theological facts and ideas, we want to find how these things that he was speaking to whatever group he was writing to at the time for whatever purpose, how those things apply in our life today in the culture in which we live. Amen. So uh, we'll take a look at uh, all of those issues as we wander along, and uh, hopefully you'll come to agree with me that uh, chapter 2, verse 1 through 4 is the best thematic statement for the whole book. 
And I think the, the phrase that jumps out of there at me is, so great a salvation. Because that is what he's trying to get across. So uh, the big debate, first of all, is who wrote it. Uh, Paul uh, was for many years the only candidate. But uh, by the time the second century had come around, the Roman church, the Western church, had uh, really begun to question that. They never did really ascribe it to Paul in the first place. Uh, the uh, Eastern Church, the, the uh, Constantinople crowd, they were uh, pretty sold on the Pauline idea. But several other people had uh, different ideas. Uh, uh, the uh, Bishop Origen and uh, Clement ascribed it to Pauline authorship in the first century. By the end of the first century, by 94 A.D. was the first time that in the, his, the writings of the, of the heads of the second generation church that somebody referenced Hebrews as a part of the canon or as a part of the, the things that were being read in the churches as scripture. And when he referenced it, he referenced it as Paul's writing to the Hebrews. <laughs> so, so we see that by the end of the first century, some of the bigwigs were calling it Paul's and were calling it scripture. Some people believe that Peter in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, where he speaks of Paul's letters, he talks about a letter to Hebrew Christians who are in dispersion because he said, he, he says to you, Paul wrote a letter to you, and that's who he was writing to at the time. And so, uh, and then, and in his other letters also. So, so they imply there that Paul must have been speaking about the epistle to the Hebrews as the letter that he wrote to you and the other epistles also and classed it as an epistle that Paul wrote to Jews. But that's, you know, you got to really work at that to make that mean Paul did it. But some people argue with the fact that uh, the doctrinal issues in Hebrews are not Pauline in their, in their nature. But if you just read Paul and then try to talk about the, the huge elaboration on the high priestly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and its significant... Uh, fulfillment of the Old Testament types and shadows of the Old Testament high priest and, the, then, and then you go to Romans chapter 8 and the 34th verse where he says Jesus is, is making intercession for us amen when you go to 1st Timothy and, and find that uh, we have one there's one mediator between God and man the man Christ Jesus to not be able to find a high priestly theme in Paul's writings you really just can't be looking very hard I suppose but it certainly is carried uh, to a much greater, almost agonizing extent in Hebrews. <laughs> and I'm sure you'll be tired of it by the time we get through with it. Uh, the arguments against Paul uh, writing the letter is, first of all, the language. There are 169 Greek words in the book of Hebrews that are never used anywhere else in the New Testament. I know you'd want to know that. Amen. Uh, many Greek scholars say that the style of the writing is different. And certainly there is more usage of Old Testament passages in Hebrews than in any other book in the New Testament. And they're used differently from the way Paul normally uses them in his epistles. Uh, they're very, it's, this is very much uh, a treatise rather than a letter in the sense that he takes Old Testament scriptures and then makes exhortation about what they mean as far as uh, confirming the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, does it, he uses actually 28 different Old Testament passages and quotes them verbatim, but he quotes them from the Septuagint in the book of Hebrews, which is not what Paul normally used for a text. See, aren't you glad you learned all of this? Some people don't have a lot to do, so they study all this stuff. Amen. Uh, the fact that it doesn't open with uh, greetings from me and Billy Bob, who's writing the letter for me, and we're, uh, we're down at... Uh, at you know, Bucko's Tavern on the corner of 3rd and 6th, and we're writing to all the saints that are at somewhere. There's no address in the beginning. All of Paul's letters have an address in the beginning, all the other letters of Paul. Amen. Tell him who he's writing to, where he is, and, and uh, greeting people, and all that sort of stuff. So that's a big one. Uh, Paul claims that he got his revelation direct from the Lord in Galatians chapter 1, doesn't he? Remember that? Look over in Galatians 1.
verse 11. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's pretty cheeky, isn't it? I cannot tell you how many young preachers I've had come and tell me that they didn't have a human teacher, that they had the Lord Jesus Christ gave them their revelation. And I just kind of smile at them and go on about my business because I think you are too stupid for me to even fool with. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. When you write 17 epistles in the New Testament, then hey, come back and talk to me. But notice here in Hebrews chapter 2, we just read the text. One of the reasons I chose this as the thematic text is in verse 3 where he says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? So whoever wrote Hebrews got his stuff from the first apostles would be my reading of that sentence, wouldn't it? And that he shared that in common with the audience, whoever they may be, that he's writing to here. Would you say that? I think that's the strongest argument against Pauline authorship. The other stuff can all be explained away. I can't get around that one. Now you know all of that. Several other candidates have been mentioned over the centuries. Luke uh, is one of the suspects. And um, because the, the, the language of Hebrews is an extremely well-educated language. It's, it's, it's obviously aimed at a uh, highbrow crowd. Amen. A lot of times the writings in the Koine Greek were not always aimed that way because Koine, by definition, means the language of the people. It's a very uh, street language almost. But uh, the language in, in the Hebrews is pretty lofty as is the use of Old Testament uh, references. Barnabas has been suggested as being the writer, and uh, mainly more than any other reason, just because the Bishop Tertullian uh, in Rome suggested him as an author around 200 A.D. Uh, there is absolutely no evidence for it other than the bishop thought so. And most of us like Barnabas. You know, he's one of my favorite characters, so I wish he had a book. Seems like I mean, Paul got a book, you know, Jude got a book, everybody got a book, Barnabas didn't get a book. So it seemed like he ought to have a book, he was a nice fella. Uh, one of the ones that I think has some traction is Apollos. Anybody remember who Apollos was? The description of him certainly fits the characteristics of whoever wrote this book. Remember in Acts chapter 18, they went down to, to uh, Corinth, they said, now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. And then he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and Aquila and Priscilla heard him, and they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And then he went on to Achaia, and uh, explain to them how Jesus was the fulfillment of all the stuff he'd been talking about before. So he was the kind of a guy, the well-educated, uh, scripturally-minded kind of a fella that could have written uh, such a treatise. Interestingly enough, another candidate for authorship is in that same passage. Uh, there's a lady whose name escapes me at the moment. I can see her picture. Uh, Mary Bain, something like that. Anyway, she's a female theologian. She decided a number of years ago that Priscilla wrote it. And there's a whole, like, mini literature out there uh, stumping for the authorship of Priscilla. Amen. Uh, so that's it. Uh, the bottom line is this, that whoever wrote it uh, had all of those characteristics and qualities. I think it's more important to discern, A, who he was writing toward or to, and then B, what he was trying to accomplish with the writing because the, uh, uh, the, the, the structure of the book of Hebrews is absolutely brilliant and beautiful. And it deserves more than we normally give it 
by yanking out a text here and a text there to prove whatever we're trying to prove at the time. I've, I've shared with you many times before, but I had an old uh, Church of God war horse and, uh, when I was in Bible school. And uh, one of his favorite statements was, if you can't find a text, find a pretext. <laughs> and unfortunately, many of us have taken that to heart over the years. I decide what I want to tell them, and then I go find some scriptures that support that. <laughs> Amen, which is one of my arguments for why we ought to teach through the Bible occasionally just and see what it actually says instead of what we like for it to say. Amen. So the timing of the writing of the book of Hebrews is another thing that gets fought over extensively, and I'm not going to bore you with all the details. But the, uh, uh, initially, the uh, timing was, was set at somewhere between 62 and 64 A.D., which also argues for Pauline authorship, by the way, uh, because at the end of the, of the book, he says, uh, whoever wrote it uh, says the brethren from Italy send their greetings, which would have placed Rome or Paul in Italy at the right time to say the guys here in Italy send their greetings. So, amen. But whoever it was was apparently either knew some Italians who had come to see him or they were in Italy when they wrote it, one or the other. Amen. So, uh, that would be good because Paul was killed in 65 A.D., right around there sometime. So 62 to 64 A.D., while he was in prison at Rome, uh, would line up with those details. Does that make sense to you? Aren't you glad you came tonight and that's exciting? What happened in 70 A.D.? Anybody remember? Yeah, Jerusalem got leveled, didn't it? And the temple with it. So uh, the other dates that uh, are proffered for this book are toward the end or the latter part of that century, which put them after the destruction of the temple. Now, here's my question for you. <laughs> if you're writing a book to Jews, and you're especially exhorting them from the Old Testament about the sacrificial system, and the temple in Jerusalem has been leveled, can you imagine writing 13 chapters and not somewhere mentioning that? I, that, to me, that just, no, that didn't happen. Really. Because the, 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 the present tense is used when they're talking about the offering of sacrifices in the book of Hebrews. The implication being that the temple's open for business as we speak. So I'm thinking, this, you know, and once again, there are smarter guys than me that have argued this, but it just seems like to me <laughs> that if the temple had been destroyed, they would have dropped that somewhere. You know, 13 chapters on the subject of the Old Testament sacrificial system, you think you would mention that the temple's gone. Oh, by the way. <laughs> so, enough said. I think it was written somewhere in the, in the mid-60s uh, before the temple was destroyed in 70. So who is he writing to? I know you don't think that's important, but it is important because uh, some of the interpretations that people, or some of the, these, what should we say, sophisms that people use to explain away some of the, the uh, things that the book teaches, they use by saying, well, that wasn't written to Christians. Or that was written to Gentile Christians. Or, and some other interpretations are entirely based on the absolute, absolute uh, certainty that uh, it was written to Jewish Christians who were backsliding and getting back under the law. And so... If you're going to base your interpretation on who it was written to, you better be doggone sure you know who it was written to. Now, the original title, the only title it has in the early manuscripts, is To Hebrews. And there's major argument about whether that came with the original manuscript or whether that was added somewhere along the way by a scribe. But somewhere along the way, it seems that whoever the scribe was thought it was written to Hebrews, <laughs> even if that's how it got there. And he was where? In the first century, they just got the letter, for heaven's sake. They're copying the letter. So where did he get that idea? I think he got it from reading the book. But it's been on the manuscript since earliest times. Whoever it was or whoever it's to, if, we're, if they were not extremely familiar with the Old Testament system, would have a very difficult time understanding this book. 
Most Christians today, especially American Christians, read it. They got no clue what it's talking about because they don't know uh, what the allusions are to. Uh, when he's using his, he actually uses 32 different quotations, but but uh, some of them are repeated. It's only 28 different ones. And that's not mentioning the ones where he says and and Paul's or the or Moses said or this you know allusions to Old Testament stories and issues. I'm talking about direct quotes. Uh, he can, over two per chapter. Think about that for a minute. That's a lot of scripture uh, to directly quote. So. The, uh, uh, whoever was reading this book, whoever wrote it, and I, you assume a man that, that used this kind of scholarly language had enough sense to write a letter to people in language that they would have some chance of understanding. So I'm thinking that he thought that the people he was writing to would know what it meant when he said, don't do what they did in the day of provocation. <laughs> Amen. Uh, he, he would know that they'd read that song. Amen. So, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, whoever it was, whether it was Jew or Gentile, they had to certainly be very familiar with Old Testament pa- uh, passages. The uh, ministry of Christ in the book of Hebrews is presented as the fulfillment of Old Testament types and pictures in the Old Testament priesthood, the Old Testament sacrifices, and the Old Testament uh, tabernacle in the wilderness. So in order to understand them and see Christ in those things, you have to be pretty intimately familiar with how that worked. The Old Testament is referred to here. Remember, look back in Hebrews 2 for a minute. I don't know if we'll get off on this somewhere along the way. You know me, we probably will. But But this will clear up a couple of scriptures for you. Notice he says in, in Hebrews 2, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we've heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, the word spoken through angels proves steadfast. That's an odd turn of a phrase, isn't it? The word spoken through angels. Uh, In order for people to understand this verse and to understand the purpose of the entire first chapter, which was talking about, because I hear people preaching it, you know, that... uh, Paul is telling us the superior, superiority of Jesus to the angels. Well, he is all right, but why did he start the book talking about the, the superiority of Jesus over the angels? When the theme of the book is our great salvation, which is so much greater than the types and shadows we had under the old covenant, why the new covenant is a better covenant with better promises, with a better mediator. What's, why did he start off talking about angels? Why? Because the Jews understood the Old Testament, as having been given to Moses by the angels. That's how they referred to it. Did you know that? That's what he's talking about here. The reason he compared Jesus to the angels was to talk about how much better now God has spoken to us through the Son. And he is so much superior to the angels who brought the first covenant. You didn't know that, did you? You can tell by the look on your face. Remember Galatians 3? You don't. Well, let's read it. Verse 19. Paul once again arguing about uh, the superiority of grace to the law. He said, verse 19, the New Living Translation says, Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. God gave his law through angels to Moses, who was the mediator between God and the people. Acts chapter 7, the 53rd verse, Stephen in his uh, great uh, sermon that he preached on the day he was martyred referred to the Old Testament being given through the angels. That uh, refer the first reference that you can find that's uh, specific to that is in Deuteronomy, in the thirty third chapter. I'm going to read to you from the Tree of Life version, which is uh, about a year old translation of the New Testament from the Messianic Christian Foundation. Well, it's got some interesting 
phraseology in it, but I kind of like the way they did this verse. He said, Adonai came from Sinai and dawned on Israel from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came from the holy myriads. King James says the, the uh, saints. He uses the term saints. Here he calls them the holy myriads, blessing fire, blazing fire for them from his right hand. Indeed, a lover of peoples is he. All his, oh gosh, kedoshim are in his hand. They followed in your steps, each receiving your words. He's talking about uh, what we would refer to as the heavenly hosts that accompanied God when he came to visit Moses. Now, see, they saw uh, when the heavenly hosts came, they saw that as being the angels bringing the law to Moses. So it was very common to refer to the Old Testament as that which was given through the angels to Moses. So that was why he started off comparing the Son to the angels, because we have a greater messenger, messenger for a greater message under the new covenant. Does that all make sense to you? Okay. So my point is this: that if you didn't know that, then you would never grasp the first chapter and a half of Hebrews, because he never stops to to explain that. As a matter of fact, here in the in the second verse is the only time that he ever uh, even gives that that uh, implication. Once again, we talk about, he wasn't teaching on that here, but in order for us to understand it, we have to go, what do you mean given through angels? What does that mean given through angels? Right? If you don't stop and do that, you're never going to understand the first chapter and a half. So, the crowd he's writing to, obviously he thought that they would get it. Now, they were also believers, Christians, who apparently had received the gospel in a fairly traditional form from the apostles, as we saw in Hebrews 2, 3, as we received from those who heard Jesus, right? So apparently they heard it uh, from the original church folks who had seen and heard Jesus. Uh, at the end of the book, in chapter 13, he promises them that uh, now that Timothy's out of jail, maybe he can come visit you. You know, at the end, you know, at the end of the book, where they started saying, oh, by the way, tell so-and-so that I saw him and, and please bring my coat if you're going to come before the winter time." At the end of Hebrews, one of the things he tells them is, and Timothy just got out of jail, so he might be able to come see you. So what does that tell us? That tells us that whoever these people are he's writing to knew Timothy. He didn't even find it necessary to explain who Timothy was, which he did in some of the other letters. But here he, he knew that that would be a big deal to them that Timothy was coming to see him. They were acquainted with Italian believers. And the writer wanted to come see them. Hebrews 13, the 19th verse, he says, And more abundantly do I call upon you to do this, that is pray, the 18th verse, he asked him to pray for him. Do I want you to, I call upon you to do this, that more quickly I may be restored to you. When he wrote to the Romans, he said, pray for me that I'll be able to come to you. He'd never been to Rome. But here, he didn't say that I can come to you. He said that I may be restored. See, what's that mean? He'd been there before. <laughs> they knew Timothy, and he'd been there before. I think that's a pretty good argument for Paul, personally. But, but the <clears throat> So, He's writing to a group of people with a very deep and abiding understanding of the Old Testament. He's writing to people that know Jesus Christ, crucified, dead and buried, raised again the third day. Amen. Doing signs and wonders, confirmed by the Holy Ghost. So these people have been around some Holy Ghost fire. Amen. Amen. We know that they must have been undergoing the temptation to move away from faithfulness to this gospel message. You know, what are, what are we going to do if we uh, don't take heed to so great a salvation? What's that? He's warning them. Amen. Let's not let this pass by. This Jesus deal is a pretty good deal. Amen. 
in chapter 3, he says, take care of your heart that you don't allow to enter in an evil heart of unbelief. Okay? So I would say that he's warning them about that. Verse Chapter 4, he said, don't forget to add faith to your hearing. Chapter 5, he warns them, uh, don't become complacent by substituting ritual and head knowledge for reality. Chapter 6, he said, don't give up and fall back under the Old Testament ritual to save you. Press on toward Jesus. Chapter 7 through 10, he goes through that great salvation uh, that has a great high priest who's real in the heavenly holy of holies. He teaches us in those chapters to take advantage of the access we have through the veil of his torn flesh. Don't neglect such a great salvation. Hebrews chapter 10, the 35th verse, he says, Do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that He has promised. Doesn't that sound like to you? He's trying to encourage people who are in the midst of a battle to press on. Chapter 12 is a call to run the race with endurance, citing the examples that he gave in chapter 11 of all the heroes of the Old Testament, by faith. Why was the emphasis in chapter 11 by faith? Because they were tempted to get back under works. What was he emphasizing? Did you ever notice in that list in chapter 11 that all of the people that he mentions and and then tells, you know, uh, by faith, uh, they did this by faith, Enoch walked with God and was not. Uh, By faith, Sarah believed God. By faith, Abraham believed God. And the last one he mentions in that list of what they did was who? Moses. What happened, what, what happened with Moses that changed the by faith formula? Received the law. Up until Moses, there was no law. And if you read the things that Moses did by faith, he wouldn't receive the law. What was the point he was trying to make? Everybody has always been saved by faith through grace. They've never been saved by the law. Don't neglect so great a salvation by trying to get back under the ritual of the law. In chapter 12, he said, we have this great cloud of witnesses watching us. Let's run with patience the race that's set before us. And then he begins to talk about how the Lord deals with us under this new covenant as believers with the Spirit on the inside. And he closes that chapter by saying our God is a consuming fire. Then in chapter 13, he gives a series of admonitions uh, to the band of believers there that makes no sense unless he's writing to a local church. None whatsoever. None whatsoever. So what is the point and the purpose of Hebrews? Well, here in chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, he tells us um, some of it. He said, we need to give more earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away. There's the first word of warning in the book of Hebrews. Lest, I love it, he said, we drift away. We drift away need to give more earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away. Amen. Amen. Part of the purpose of the book of Hebrews is to encourage us not to drift away. Amen. He said, uh, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? I believe the overarching purpose of the book of Hebrews is to make real to us the greatness of the salvation that's ours in the completed work of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 3, he said, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. What's he doing? He's emphasizing the excellency of Jesus Christ. Chapter 3, the 7th through the 15th verses. 
He goes down to the 94th Psalm and starts talking about the day of rebellion in the wilderness when the children of Israel turned away. And in verse 12 he says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Amen. So there's an, ad, uh, an aspect of, of warning in the book of Hebrews about what can happen if we let our faith turn to complacency and work. He ended that passage by saying, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion. Hebrews chapter 4, he says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those that heard it. We preach a lot of good faith sermons out of that passage. But the point there was to warn us not to miss the promise by falling from faith. What's he saying? He said you can listen and hear all you want to, but sometimes you, somewhere along the way you've got to mix some faith with what you heard. Amen. Amen. And then, of course, down to the, uh, the end of chapter 4, he said, be diligent, in verse 11, to enter into that rest. And then in verse 16 he said, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. What's the cure to hearing but not believing? Come boldly to the throne of grace. Come bold. We have a great high priest, not just any old high priest, not the Old Testament high priest, not the Aaronic high priest, and not him and his, his sorry sons uh, that tried to steal the, the cows after they killed them. No, not, none of that whole priesthood is around anymore. We have a great high priest who's touched with the feelings of our infirmities, the one great thing that he compares Jesus and Aaron about, the one thing that Jesus has in common with Aaron is that he was one of us, and therefore he knows how we feel. That was the only reason that Jesus walked in the Aaronic priesthood, was so that his humanity could allow him to have compassion for stumble bums like us. Amen. We'll see some of that in great depth. So he's encouraging us then to overcome the lack of faith by coming boldly to the throne and finding grace to help in the time of need. Chapter 5, he begins to talk about the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, which argues for the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ and his eternal existence. And at the end of that chapter, he says, By this time you ought to be teachers. The book of Hebrews is about encouraging us to stand up and become what we were created to be and not be those who have need once again to be taught the first principles of the oracles of God. Hebrews chapter 6, he encourages them. We desire that each one of you sow the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end and that you do not become sluggish but imitate those who through faith and patience Inherit the promises. Hallelujah. What's he doing? He's encouraging us to hang in there and keep pushing. Chapter 7. He said, talking about the, the uh, high priesthood or the priesthood of Melchizedek, he said, consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. What's he doing? He's want, wanting them to consider the greatness of the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just human like Aaron's priesthood, but it's eternal like Melchizedek's, to whom even Abraham brought a tenth of the spoils. Verse 26, he said, We have such a great high priest who is fitting for us, who's holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. He's emphasizing what? Such a great salvation. Chapter 8. We could have just used this verse for the whole evening. Verse 1. You've got to have help to misunderstand this. Verse 1. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying, in case you all hadn't figured it out. Now this is the main point. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Hallelujah. We have such a high priest. He can be touched with our infirmities just like Aaron because he was human. But he is eternal like Melchizedek. 
Hallelujah. Chapter 9. He said, Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. The Lord Jesus Christ is not going through uh, religious rituals. He has entered into the heavenly holy of holies, and He appears before God for us. Amen. Don't neglect so great a salvation. Amen. Chapter 10, verse 10, he said, By that will, that is the will of God, we have been sanctified. We have been sanctified. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. <laughs> Glory to God. Oh, let's not neglect so great a salvation. Amen. Chapter 10, the 19th verse. Therefore, brethren, having boldness, to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, which He consecrated for us through the veil that is His flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Can you hear the comparison He's making between the Old Testament ritual and the New Testament uh, mediatorship of the Lord Jesus Christ? He gives us the privilege of already being sanctified and being able to enter the Holy of Holies through the veil of His flesh by faith. We can have assurance. Amen. Let's not neglect so great a salvation. Verse 23, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Amen. He says, we're going to need one another to do what? Encourage one another to not become complacent, not to draw back. He goes on to say in that same chapter, Do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance. Look at somebody and say, You have need of endurance. Amen. We don't like that, but it's in there anyway, isn't it? You have need of endurance. Amen. Why? So that after you have done the will of God, you can receive the promises. Glory to God. He ends that chapter by saying, We are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Amen. Who are we? We're not those who draw back. We're of those who believe. Amen. Verse, chapter 11. He ends that chapter, that list of all the great heroes of faith, by faith. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. And he ends that chapter in uh, verse 39 and 40. He said, All these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided, listen to me now, something better for us. Woo, glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, you can, get a, you can get a buzz out of preaching all the wonderful stuff that happened in chapter 11. But in the last verse, he said, and we got a better deal for you. Woo! Glory to God. Having provided something better for us, that they, listen to this, the reason that the great cloud of witnesses is cheering us on in the first two verses of chapter 12 is why? Because they didn't receive the promise. He's given something better for us. Why? That they should not be made perfect apart from us. Perfect meaning that the Greek word is teleos. It means to achieve the fullness of their purpose. The Old Testament saints, as great as they were and as wonderful as the stories are, will not fulfill their purpose if we quit. Therefore, run with patience the race that is set before us. Glory to God. That's what he was talking about in Hebrews 12. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher 
of our faith. That's what he was talking about. We're going to finish the race that Abraham started, that Isaac started, hallelujah, that Moses started. We're going to finish the race and bring to its fulfillment and fruition and completion the fulfillment of the purpose of the lives of those great men of faith. Amen. We are going to run our race to the finish line. And the, the power to do that comes through not looking to what we have to do to earn grace, not looking to what we have to do to please God by our works, but looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Twelve chapters into the book of Hebrews and all the different descriptions of all the different sacrifices and all the different bulls and all the different goats and all the different altars and all the different priests. He said, here's the sum total of it. Keep running and keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Do not neglect such a great salvation. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory, 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 glory. Hebrews chapter 12 then goes on. Uh, to talk about the ways God deals with us, corrects His people, that we ought to encourage one another, lift up the hand that hang down. Amen. And if we're out of the line of, of the will of God, get back in it, because the Father's trying to get us in the race. And then in verse 28, He said, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Let us have grace. Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Amen. Hallelujah. And then in chapter 13, he begins to just give a, a list of little admonitions that make no sense whatsoever if he wasn't writing to a local body of believers. Because he's talking about how to act as you live out this kingdom that can't be shaken here on the earth with your eyes on Jesus running the race. What do you do? Chapter 13, he just starts down through the list. He said, uh, uh, don't let brotherly love fall by the wayside. Don't forget to entertain strangers. Amen. And uh, verse 3, he said, remember the prisoners. Amen. Remember the prisoners. And then verse 4, he says, and, and be sure and honor marriage. I mean, you talk about a, a to-do list. He said, let your, let your conduct be without covetousness. Why can we let your, con why let your conduct be without covetousness? Have you ever read that? We, we like to read the last part of that verse and then the, the next verse together and then preach good sermons about never fearing. But there's nothing wrong with that. But what was he talking about when he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you? He said, let your be without covetousness. Why? Because I'll never leave you nor forsake He's saying, you don't have to clamor after stuff. I've got you. Hallelujah. That'll preach. Verse 7, he said, remember those who rule over you and follow their faith. Amen. Verse 8, he said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Verse 9, he says, it's good that the heart be established by grace. Jesus Christ, listen to that, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. From the first of Hebrews 11 and the Old Testament saints until the last day when Gabriel blows the horn, Jesus Christ has never changed. Grace has never changed, and the hearts that make it into the promise have never changed. They are established on grace. Hallelujah. Verse 12. He said, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate, outside the city. Therefore, let's go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Have you ever wondered what that verse is talking about? The, sac the sacrifices in the Old Testament were offered by the priesthood in the city. And then they took the, the useless pieces of, of horse flesh outside and burned them outside. Jesus went outside the camp. Why? Because he was going to a different temple. He was going to the one in the sky. He went outside the city and offered himself. He said, let's go outside of the religious ritual that we have been surrounded with for lo these many years. Let's get outside the camp where Jesus is. Amen. Verse 13, he then said, Therefore, let's continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. 
You want to live outside the camp where grace reigns? Let your mouth be filled with the praises of God. And then he said, don't forget to do good and to share with those sacrifices. God is well pleased. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. Verse 18, pray for us. Verse 20, he began to pray for them. May the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do His will, working in you what is well-pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Notice what He did not say. He didn't say, you need to shape up. Here's the list of things that you need to do in order to be a proper Christian. He said, I'm praying that the same God that raised Jesus from the dead, who is the great shepherd of the sheep, uh, because of the blood of the everlasting covenant, will make you complete for every good work, working in you to do what is well pleasing in His sight. Glory to God. Can you hear the difference? We don't want to be in the city where the walls surround us and the sheep are still bleeding as they're offered on the altar. We want to be outside the city where the Lord Jesus Christ offered Himself a perfect sacrifice. Amen. Hearts established in grace and allowing God to do the work in us instead of to us. Hallelujah. Verse 23, he said, 22, I said, I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation, for I have written to you in few words. So I would argue that if you look at the content of the argument from the beginning to the end, the first four verses of Hebrews uh, sound like an echo of the first verses of Genesis and the first verses of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Here in, in Hebrew, Hebrews, he starts out, God spoke to us through many times, many different ways uh, by the prophets, but now in this last day, He has spoken to us through Son. Amen. He's making the argument that this Jesus is God, and that this salvation He offers is greater than anything that's been seen before, and that to keep our eyes anywhere but on Him is to neglect so great a salvation. Let's read again then from Hebrews 2. Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard Him. God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to His own will. Amen. We are not going to neglect so great a salvation. We're going to let God confirm to us and bear witness through signs and wonders. Hallelujah. For the next I don't know how long, we're going to go just a little section at a time and dig into that great salvation. We're going to learn the greatness of our high priest. We're going to consider Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We're going to establish our hearts in grace. And through faith and patience, we will inherit the promises. Let's stand up. Well, did you all survive the introduction? I would encourage you, if you haven't ever done this, take, a, take some time this week when you've got to, it won't take too long, 20 minutes maybe, and uh, just bust out Hebrews and just read it from beginning to end out loud. Not like you were just reading, you know. Some, I, I remember going to an Episcopalopian funeral in Oneonta. Remember Phil? He passed away. They had a, a funeral at the Episcopalopian Church. No, that wasn't him either. It was. A, I'm sorry, the, the different lady. It was her aunt. What was her name? Anyway, the uh, but the priest got up. I'd never been to one before, you know. And uh, he got up and he started to read the 23rd Psalm. You know, and here's the body laying up there and everybody. I didn't have the. I didn't know the program. You know, we'd all bow and we. You know, I didn't know what we were doing. And uh, but the. But he got to, to uh, read the psalm as they lived. They picked up the 
cast it to him. And he, he began, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. It was so dead <laughs> and so dry and the syntax was so far off that if you didn't know the 23rd Psalm, you would have missed the whole point. Uh, because he was just reading words. Hey, man, I, I like to read these, uh, especially this one, because I, I really believe this was a treatise. It may have even been a sermon at some point in time. Because we, uh, Read it sometime. And, and let yourself uh, get excited about the points at the end of each section. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. But you have not resisted unto blood. I mean, this book will preach. And this old boy that put it together knew how to put one together. Read it out loud like you were trying to convince somebody. And then you'll understand why it's so important. Not to just take a verse and a half somewhere. But to understand, what was God trying to say to the church when he wrote a letter to Hebrews? Amen. Amen. Look at somebody and say, don't neglect that great salvation. Don't neglect that great salvation. Hallelujah. There will be uh, some folks over here to pray for you. If you have need uh, of healing in your body tonight, don't leave sick. Uh, but these folks, they'll be right over here in front of these chairs. And... Uh, Allow them to pray for you. Amen. Bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you for your wonderful word. We thank you for the so great salvation that you provided in the Lord Jesus Christ for us. We thank you, Father, and we praise you for that word that keeps us steadfast. As we, uh, Father, we're not going to let it drift away. We're going to hang on to the things that we've heard. We thank you, Father, for the ones who've spoken the word to us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who has confirmed it, bearing witness with signs and wonders and various miracles. We thank you, Father God, for giving us the capacity to establish our hearts in grace. We praise you for the blood of the covenant and for the Lord Jesus Christ who's working in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. I thank you for it and commit these precious people to your care in Jesus' name. Amen.